One of the biggest features of animals that make them seem truly prehistoric is a sail. Spinosaurus, Dimetron and Amargosaurus are just some famous examples of prehistoric creatures that are instantly recognizable because of the large sails on their backs. Even though it's such a unique and well-studied part of anatomy, its function is not entirely known. The two most likely theories are that the sails were used for sexual selection or for thermal regulation. Sails aren't exclusive to the past though. There are quite a few modern animals that have them, and before I talk about the more famous extinct ones, I would like to cover some of these living animals, because they are just as interesting. Even though the name of these lizards make them sound like some prehistoric animal, hydrosaurs are still alive and they have a sail on their tails. These lizards can be found in Southeast Asia and are semi-aquatic. They can also run on water, just like the next animal I will talk about. The basilisk is a lizard that lives in Central America and parts of South America. They have like five different names themed around Jesus because just like the hydrosaurs, they can run on water. They use this ability to escape from predators but can only do so for short distances before sinking, so they also swim quite a lot. They are quite large lizards, being able to grow to 70 centimeters or 2 feet, although most of their length is in the tail. As I said before, they swim quite a lot and therefore they are good at it. They are able to stay underwater for 30 minutes, which is the same amount of time as a walrus. They feed on almost anything they can find, including fish, snails, insects, frogs and basically any animals that are smaller than themselves. 30% of their diet also consists of plants. Almost all of the sailfish's relatives have some sort of sail in the form of a very large dorsal fin, but the sailfish takes the cake with a dorsal fin that runs down almost the entire length of the fish and is often taller than the rest of the body. They feed on schools of small fish and cooperate in small groups by herding their prey with their sails extended in order to make them easier to catch. Females are larger than males and can be more than 3 meters long or 10 feet and weigh over 100 kilograms. When breeding them for quantity or quality, females can release millions of eggs and when the babies hatch they are only 3 millimeters long, which is a tenth of an inch. They may be the fastest fish in the world and can maybe reach more than 100 kilometers per hour, but new research has suggested that they are a lot slower than that. There is however quite a large difference in the sail of the sailfish and those of reptiles. That is because the sails that reptiles have is made up of the spinous process, also known as the neural spine, being elongated. This means that the sail is made from part of the vertebrae, which makes it so that the sail can't move independently from the rest of the body. The dorsal fin in fish, however, is made up of small bones that are connected to each other, and it can be moved, primarily being folded forwards or backwards. Sailfish, for example, fold back their sail when swimming fast to be more hydrodynamic. Despite sails being quite common in land animals, we have never discovered a mammal with one. There are some mammals with somewhat similar structures, such as bison, that have a hump on their shoulders that is made up of the muscles that move their heads, but I wouldn't call it a sail because it is much further forward on the body and it is also much thicker and not as tall as what you would call a sail. Now, with all that out of the way, let's get to some extinct animals. Platyhistrix was a temnospondyl amphibian which lived during the early Permian about 280 to 300 million years ago. Temnospondyls were a very successful and diverse order of animals which survived for more than 200 million years, from the Carboniferous to the Cretaceous. Temnospondyls may even be alive right now since some scientists believe that modern amphibians are their descendants and since a descendant of a group is a member of that group, that would mean that temnospondyls have existed for 330 million years. Platyhistrix was about a meter in length, with short legs and quite a large head. They also had that iconic sail and some armor plates on their back, which I'm gonna use to segue into talking a little bit about Cacops. Cacops was another temnospondyl, and it was in the same family as Platyhistrix, although it didn't have a sail like its relative. Anyhow, the reason I wanted to talk about Cacops is because its name means ugly look, which is just mean in my opinion. 
Their main predators were probably large reptiles such as Dimetrodon and other large species of Temnospondyls such as Areops. Platyhistrix fossils have been found in North America, and one formation they have been found in, the Abo Formation, was a very arid place with somewhere between 30 and 100 mm of rain every year. For comparison, Cuberpedi in Australia has 141 mm of average rainfall per year, and just look at this place. There were however rivers where our little amphibian lived, so most life probably stayed close to the water and platyhistrix individuals would even need water in order to lay their eggs. The synapsids are a group of animals that only have one temporal fenestra, which is a hole in the skull behind the eyes. Even though many people haven't heard of synapsids, they actually still exist. In fact, we mammals are synapsids. The clade synapsida is about as old and diverse as the clade reptilia, which in my opinion shows how big the whole group is. Since synapses have been around for so long, they have been able to fill a lot of niches, and as you hopefully already figured out, some of them had sails. Quite a lot of them in fact. The synapses were most common during the Permian, which was when they were the most dominant and also reached their largest sizes before the Cenozoic, so it should come as no big surprise that all of the synapses with sails existed during this time. All species that we discovered with sails so far belong to two groups of close related synapsids, the Daphosauridae and the Svenacodontia. The first genus I will talk about is the Daphosaurus, which is quite a famous Permian animal that actually evolved during the late Carboniferous around 303 million years ago. It went extinct during Olsen's extinction, which was a small extinction event around 270 million years ago. This extinction event in fact wiped out all the Evadaphosaurids and also Anacodonts. Olsen's extinction is thought to have been caused by changes in the climate. I wonder where I've seen that before. Anyways, we have discovered 5 different species in the Daphosaurus genus, but this video isn't long enough to go into detail about each one, so I will just talk about general information here. As with all animals in this video, their most defining feature is their sail, but it was actually quite different from, the, from those of the other animals. For one, they had branch-like grooves on the spine that made up the sail, and the last couple of neural spines were also bent backwards, which isn't that obvious unless you look quite closely. And I couldn't find any sources that even theorized why their sail was like this, so I would love it if someone with knowledge about that could leave me a comment, because I'm really curious about this. Yet another interesting thing about the sail of Edaphosaurus in particular is that the species that lived later had evolved to have bigger sails than their ancestors, which is kind of understandable, but they also interestingly had fewer of the famous elongated spines, but their sails as a whole were still bigger. Edaphosaurus's bodies were quite large and thick with two C's, and they also had very short and stubby legs. The smallest species only grew to around half a meter or two feet, while the biggest of them could go to three and a half meters in length, that's 11 feet, and they could weigh more than 300 kilograms or 660 pounds. Their heads were very, very small, and in the front they had small pig-like teeth, and in the back of their mouths they had tooth plates that they used to grind up plant matter. They also most likely had very large guts in order to break down their fiber-rich diets. Echinerpeton is the oldest synapse that we have discovered. It lived 308 million years ago during the late Carboniferous and was neither an Edaphosaurid or a Svenacodont. They were rather small and most likely ate insects and other small animals. Its sail wasn't nearly as large as Edaphosaurus's or Dimetrodon's, instead it was more like a ridge. Stenospondylus was a large predator, being able to reach sizes of 3 meters in order to dispatch their prey, they had a large head with sharp teeth. They lived in the same place and time as Dimetrodon, and thus they were very likely competitors for food. They also looked very similar to Dimetrodon, and they were even part of the same family, the Svenacodontinae. Compared to its relatives, Stenospondylus had quite a small sail, but it was still much larger than the likes of Echinerpeton. Svenacodon was a very large Svenacodontian, and you might have been able to guess that it was part of the Svenacodontia family, because like, uh, they got the same name, so you really should have figured that one out. Like Echinerpeton, it also had quite a small sail, with it being more like a ridge composed of the neural spines. 
They lived at the same time as Dimetrodon, but they were separated by the Hueco Seaway, which was a small sea on the western coast of Pangaea, and I had never heard about it before researching this video, which is kinda neat. There were two species of Svenacodon, S. ferox and S. ferocior, the latter of which could grow to 3 meters in length, which is about 10 feet. Except for the sail, they looked very similar to Dimetrodon, with a large and tall head, short neck and a long tail. Okay, now it's finally time for the sail synapsid you've all been waiting for. The most famous of them all, the one that every child has a toy of, the synapsid which is so often confused for a dinosaur. That's right, it's time for Secodontosaurus. Oh, you thought I would talk about the Metro next? Uh, well, uh, well, this is much better. I mean, just look at this thing. Uh, but don't worry, I will talk about the Metrodon soon. The name Secodontosaurus means cutting tooth lizard, but if you spell the Secodont part wrong, it means something wildly different. And trust me, I learned that from experience by accidentally googling it. Despite having a lizard in its name, Secodontosaurus was yet another part of the Synacodontidae family which lived in the western part of Pangaea around 280 million years ago, just like pretty much everything I've talked about in this part of the video. And honestly, that tells a really good story about a very unique ecosystem filled with loads of sailed back animals, and that's just so incredible to me, and in my opinion, the Permian is the most underrated and unrepresented period in Earth's history. Anyways, back to Secodontosaurus. They were also predators, but did actually look kinda different from their relatives and neighbors Dimetrodon and Svenacodon, because they were more slender and had a very crocodile-like skull. They were also slightly smaller, with a maximum length of 2.7 meters and a more probable weight of 110 kilograms or 250 pounds, which is about the same size of a tiger. A very small tiger, and that says a lot about tigers. Tigers are epic. The elongated jaws of Secodontosaurus have made some scientists believe that they were specialized in eating fish or animals that live in burrows, which, is, which would be an example of niche partitioning. Before I move over to talking about our next synapsid, I want to tell you all something important that's close to my heart. And that is that Secodontosaurus looks incredibly epic and it's just such a cool animal and I wish they were still alive because it's so epic and I would want one as a pet. You know what, if this video gets 5 likes and gives me 5 subscribers, I will make a video about how to take care of a Secodontosaurus as a pet. Okay, deal? Great. Anyways, now I will talk about Bohemia clavulus, which was a close relative of Daphosaurus, and it also had a sail on its back. And we don't know a lot about this animal, since everything that has been discovered is a single fragment of spine, which was discovered in 1895 in Czechia. Bohemia clavulus lived during the end of the Carboniferous. Gordodon is a very interesting edaphosaurid that we know a lot about due to how well preserved the only fossil we have is. The fossil was named NMMNHP70796 and was discovered in 2013 and shows much of the front half of the animal. And it is really beautiful with the skull looking 3D and almost all details on the skeleton itself being visible. The name of Gordodon means fat tooth, and it was named after its weird dentition, with incisors at the front and a lot of peg-like teeth further back. The fossil was discovered very close to the boundary between the Carboniferous and Permian, which means that the species is almost certainly lived in both periods. They were smaller than most other daphosaurids, only reaching a meter in length and weighing about the same as a lynx. Its sail was also slightly different from its relatives since those small bumps on the vertebrae that I talked about earlier are more pointed in Gordodon and they are placed randomly along the bones, seemingly without any pattern or symmetry. Ianthosaurus was a very small edaphosaurid, only growing to 75 centimeters or 30 inches. It also lived very early, about 304 million years ago, which is about 5 million years before Gordodon. Ianthosaurus also seemed to be insectivorous, because they had thin and sharp teeth, which could have been used to catch such food. The last synapsid I will talk about before Dimetrodon is Lupiosaurus, which is quite a large Daphosaurus, growing to 3 meters in length, which lived during the Permian around 295 million years ago. 
Okay, now it's finally time for the big one, the one you've all been waiting for, Dimetrodon. There were many different species of Dimetrodon which lived from 295 million years ago to 270 million years ago. All but one species have been found in the United States, with Dimetrodon teutonis having been excavated in Germany. The large species could grow to a staggering 4.6 meters in length, that's more than 15 feet. The smallest species was Dimetrodon teutonis, which grew to between 60 cm and 1.7 meters. My sources differed on this number. All Dimetrodon species are predators. They had tall skulls and serrated teeth that used to slice flesh. The sail was not very unlike its relatives, it was made up of tall neural spines that were connected with skin. The areas that Dimetrodon inhabited were most likely wetlands and river deltas where the plentiful supply of water allowed plants to grow quickly, fueling the herbivores that Dimetrodon would have fed on. We have discovered quite a lot of other animals from the ecosystem where Dimetrodon lived, most notably Diplocallus, Aeriops and the Daphosaurids, which may have been a food source for Dimetrodon. Dimetrodon teutonis, on the other hand, lived in Germany, where there seemingly weren't many large predators to feed on the large herbivorous synapsids, and Dimetrodon teutonis didn't fill that niche either, since they were so small they most likely ate insects and small vertebrates. One important thing to know about Dimetrodon is that it wasn't a dinosaur, and in fact, no Dimetrodon ever met a dinosaur since they lived 40 million years apart. Poposauroids were a superfamily of archosaurs that were more closely related to crocodilians than to dinosaurs. They were very diverse and lived throughout pretty much the entire Triassic. Importantly for this video, there were two families within Poposauridae that had sails, the Tenosauricidae and the Lotosauridae, the latter of which was herbivorous and looked absolutely fucking stupid. So naturally, I will begin talking about the slightly more boring Stenosauricidae, you know, to increase viewer attention and stuff. We have discovered seven different genuses belonging to Stenosauricidae. All of them had sails, but I'll only talk about the most well-known, Stenosauriscus and the somewhat famous Arizonasaurus. The Stenosauriscus genus evolved 247 million years ago, which makes them one of the earliest archosaurs, the group containing birds, dinosaurs and crocodiles that we know of. Only parts of the sail are known from this species, so we don't know a lot about them. Stenosauriscus was most likely quite large, maybe 3 meters long, and quadrupedal. They also most likely ate meat, since their closest relatives are carnivorous. Arizonasaurus was a close relative to Stenosauriscus, which lived in what is now Papua New Guinea. It was also a carnivorous and... Oh wait, my notes are wrong. The fossils were found in Arizona, sorry about that. So anyways. They were slightly smaller than Stenosauriscus, and their sail wasn't as wide or as tall. It is quite well studied due to a very complete fossil that was discovered in 2002, which preserved most of the front half of the animal. Arizonasaurus lived 243 million years ago. Lotosaurus was another poposauroid which lived in what is now China. Most fossils have been discovered in a single location, which was creatively nicknamed the Lotosaurus site. 38 individuals have been found there, and some of them are almost complete. As you can see by these pictures, they were weird buggers, and I think these animals are the epitome of the weird Triassic fauna. Lotosaurus lived 238 million years ago, and may have grown to a size of 2.5 meters or 8 feet. They were herbivores that used their toothless beaks to strip leaves from plants. The most likely theories for why all of these animals ended up at the Lotosaurus site include the group dying of disease or all of them dying of thirst during a drought. There were quite a few dinosaurs that had sails, and those animals are the last ones I will talk about in this video, and in order to hopefully increase my viewer retention statistic for this video, I will begin talking about Oranosaurus, then some sauropods that had sails, then a couple of theropods, and then, at the very end, I will talk about the most famous animal with a sail on its back, Spinosaurus. Okay? You good with that? Great. Oranosaurus was a hadrosaur which lived in Africa during the early Cretaceous. 
They were quite Flat. large at 8 meters in length and they could weigh more than 2 tons which is the same as a white rhinoceros. Oranosaurus was somewhat closely related to Iguanodon and it also had a thumb spike, although that of Oranosaurus was much smaller and less obvious. They were most likely mainly quadrupedal but may have been able to stand on their hind legs occasionally. Judging by the size of muscle attachment points on the bones of the tail, some scientists believe that Oranosaurus was unable to run particularly fast. Interestingly, Oranosaurus is the only ornithopod, which is a group that includes hadrosaurs and their closest relatives, that has been preserved with horns. Their habitat was dominated by rivers, and Oranosaurus is thought to have been the third most common herbivore there. Some of the predators in their ecosystem were Sucomimus, Cryptops, Corcoradontosaurus, and the massive crocodilian Sarcosuchus. The sauropods were the largest land animals ever, with some larger species being able to grow close to 100 tons. Those massive titanosaurs aren't what I will talk about now though, instead I will talk about the relatively tiny Amorgasaurus. Amorgasaurus could only grow to 13 meters and live during the early Cretaceous, 129 to 122 million years ago. It was discovered in Argentina. We only have a single fossil of Amorgosaurus, but that fossil is very complete, so we know a lot about it. Their body plan was very similar to other sauropods, you know, long neck, etc. Amorgosaurus did however have a shorter neck than most sauropods. They had extended neural spines on top of their neck, which are very weird since they split down the length of the animal, leading to two neural spines sticking out instead of one. This makes figuring out its purpose difficult, and there are a couple of theories. The first theory is that the spines were a sail. Some scientists have argued that it could have been two sails next to each other, but that is unlikely according to others due to how close the spines are to each other. Though scientists instead argue that Amargosaurus only had one sail which was thicker than those of other similar animals. Another theory is that the spines weren't connected by a sail at all and instead functioned more like horns with which Amargosaurus could have stabbed predators from behind, like a sable antelope or an Arabian oryx does today. If this theory is correct, it is very likely that Amargosaurus would have had a keratin covering on their spines. Supporters of this theory point to one of Amargosaurus's relatives, Basharasaurus, which had even longer spines which would have been even more effective for defense. The main problem with this theory is that since the neural spines are connected to the rest of the spine, any injury to them could cause massive damage to other parts of the animal. Theropods such as Acrocanthosaurus, Concavenator, Sucomalmus and Spinosaurus also had elongated neural spines, but the most spectacular of these is definitely Spinosaurus aegypticus, which is the last animal I will talk about in this video. Spinosaurus lived in North Africa during the late Cretaceous. It inhabited the famous River of Giants, which contained many massive animals, such as the aforementioned Spinosaurus, the gigantic Crocodilian Sarcosuchus, the massive Coelocanth Masonia, the ginormous sawfish Oncopristis, the large Cyphactinus relative Aedachar, the big 3 meter long Bicher Bavitius, the colossal lungfish at Canodus, which grew to a meter in length, the very small freshwater plesiosaur, Lectocleididae, and the enormous Carcharodontosaurus, the considerable indeterminate ankylosaur, the flat faced Rugops, the ample sauropod, Rebachiasaurus, the capacious pterosaur, Alanca, the voluminous indeterminate Astarchid, and lastly, the salutary Thesaurus. Spinosaurus was the longest carnivorous land animal ever, and it may even have been the heaviest, but it didn't reach this size by eating other dinosaurs. Spinosaurus had a diet which was almost exclusively made up of fish. It is quite an infamous dinosaur due to how much our understanding of how it looked has changed throughout the years. It was first discovered in 1912 and was described as a new species in 1915 by Ernst Stromer. This original fossil, the holotype, consisted of parts of the lower jaw and parts of the spine, including the tall neural spines. At that time, Spinosaurus was thought to have been quite a normal theropod, 
and it was reconstructed with a kangaroo-like posture, small arms and a short head, which was the norm at the time. The fossil was housed in the Bavarian State Collection of Paleontology in Munich, where it can still be found to this day. No, I'm just kidding, it blew up in a British bombing raid. <laughs> After Stromer's Spinosaurus was destroyed, it took a very long time for any major new science could be done regarding Spinosaurus. That was until 2014 when Isar Ibrahim and his crew released a paper on Spinosaurus, which argued, based on new fossils they had discovered in the Chem Chem beds of Morocco, that Spinosaurus Eupticus was, well, this. What they had discovered was that Spinosaurus was a quadrupedal, likely swimming, fish-eating dinosaur. Although scientists had long known that Spinosaurus was at least partially aquatic, this came as a shock to the paleontology world, and Nisar Ibrahim immediately became a rock star. Okay, not really, but he did become quite famous. That wasn't it, however, for Ibrahim. Just a few years after his first paper, he and his team released yet another one which described a new fossil they had discovered, and the most interesting thing about this specific fossil was the tail. The bones in the tail were much taller than usual, and they could have supported a sort of tail fluke, which would mean that Spinosaurus most likely was a very good swimmer. And that was the most accepted theory for a few years, until a new paper came out on November 30th, 2022. That paper had created a digital Spinosaurus to which they added all soft tissues that would have been present in life, and their findings heavily disputed those of Ibrahim. According to the more recent study, Spinosaurus was bipedal, walking on two legs, and couldn't swim well at all. Apparently, the tail fluke is too rigid to be used to paddle, and in all other land vertebrates that evolved to go back into the water, the tail flukes are only made up of soft tissue, and it's unlikely that Spinosaurus would evolve an entirely unique tail fluke style if it used it for swimming. The paper also argued that because of its center of mass, Spinosaurus wouldn't have been able to stay upright in the water without constantly balancing itself. In fact, this is the orientation in which Spinosaurus would have been balanced. Not very comfortable, right? There are still very many issues with our understanding of Spinosaurus, and we probably need more discoveries in order to find out how it really lived. For now, all we know is that it was very large, lived near rivers, and ate a lot of fish. I mean, that's not uh, everything, but it's the most important stuff, so uh, good enough, I say. So, to summarize, sails have evolved more than 10 different times in the history of life in everything from lizards to dinosaurs to crocodilians to fish and to synapsids, so it must serve some purpose. Maybe not the same purpose in all of these animals, but still some purpose, and the sad thing is that we don't know their purpose yet. The exciting thing however is that the next discovery is always right around the corner, and someday we will most likely know, and that's what helps me sleep at night. Thank you so much for watching this video all the way through. Uh, I promised to release it a couple of weeks back and uh, that didn't happen because uh, I thought that this video would be like 10 minutes long and it uh, is currently 28 minutes and 30 seconds. So uh, that's my bad, but um, if you watch this all the way through, I really appreciate it. Thank you.